All right. Seems like we're at time. Uh, so welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is Data Processing is Made of People, a case study in role empathic API design in Sahara. And that word empathic is really sort of the core of what I want to talk about today. Uh, fundamentally, this is a talk about user experience and user stories in OSS infrastructure. Uh, so what are we doing here? To start out, um, so a little story. Uh, I started my career not as a software engineer, but as a nurse. Uh, and one of the first things that I did in nursing school was open my textbook to the first chapter, and I saw a figure that looked a little bit like this. It said, one of the most important virtues to have as a nurse uh, is the ability to show empathy, to understand what another person is feeling or thinking. And one of the ways you can demonstrate empathy is by placing your hand on someone's shoulder. See figure 4.2. <laughs> and so I've, I've created sort of a copyright safe version. I didn't want to actually use the picture, and it's legal ramifications and whatnot. Um, but I mentioned this for two reasons. The first is that empathy is a really hard virtue to talk about without sort of getting very sickly sweet very quickly. Right? It's, it, it's hard. We, we all know how important virtue empathy is. We all know how important it is to connect with another person, understand where they're coming from, and respond to it appropriately. But to talk about it in depth uh, is, is hard to do effectively. Uh, and secondly, you know, it's very obvious why a nurse needs empathy. That's very core to that job. But at the same time, I'm going to argue that empathy is really at the heart of what software developers do as well, and that in the end, we are only possibly doing our job as well as we are able to be empathic to our end users. Um, and we're going to get more concrete about it, though, than figure 4.2. Um, so moving on, the problem that we're going to be talking about fundamentally re revolves around the idea that building a very clean, intuitive user experience in OSS infrastructure products, in which you're trying to tie together many, many backends, many implementations of the same use case, is very hard to do uh, in a user empathic way, in a way that lets the user know where they are and what to do next. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about user stories, which are a traditional agile approach to dealing with this problem. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a solution to the problem that occasionally works, did for one use case in Sahara this cycle. Um, it's going to have a little to do with empathy, and we're going to use a Liberty feature in Sahara as an example of it. Uh, and then we're going to have a conclusion. So in case you're not terrifically familiar with Sahara, uh, who, who, doesn't really, who isn't really familiar with Sahara? Luigi, get your hand down. You're ridiculous. Um, so, so a few people. Cool. Um, so Sahara fundamentally has two major portions. Um, API v1.0, the cluster management API, allows you to create templates which allow you to sort of reproducibly create big data processing clusters, whether these are Hadoop, Spark, Storm, or any of the various distributions of Hadoop, uh, Hortonworks, MapR, Cloudera. We have plugins for all of those data processing engines, and you can spin up any of those clusters using Sahara. Then we have an elastic data processing engine, which allows you to actually you know, create templates for your jobs once you've created them, store them in Sahara so that you can run them on data over and over again using a, a more limited set of configuration values. Uh, and that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. Today, primarily, we're going to be talking about EDP. And we're specifically going to be talking about the bit right between create job template there, where you're solidifying the job that you've written, putting it into Sahara in a reproducible way, and then the step where you actually run it. That's a, a critical flow arrow, uh, and we're going to be talking about why in just a few minutes. 
So you might want to be here. Um, hopefully, if, if you're an OpenStack ATC, uh, you're very much the target audience, and you care about UX, you care about your user sanity, you want to write APIs that are going to make people feel at home and like they know where to go next. Um, and you want to compare notes with me because, you know, I've, we did something that I think is cool and that people might want to know about and might well be reproducible in other projects. Uh, if you're a Sahara customer or you're interested in potentially adopting Sahara in the future, you will learn about a new feature that will make it easier for organizations to run EDP jobs um, reproducibly and efficiently. Or you're just a really huge UX geek, and you really like to talk about Agile, and that's great, and you should come talk to me afterwards, and we'll geek out forever, and it'll be fabulous. All right, so how are we doing for time? We're doing perfectly fine. Uh, so the problem that we're addressing. So we'll first go to the concretion. Sahara allows you to create these job templates uh, that encapsulate this reproducible big data job they map to specific jar files which you've written. You may have written them in Java, in Pig, in Hive, Storm, Spark, etc. Um, they allow configuration per run, right? So when you write a big data job, there are a number of configuration parameters that you can bake into it to make it more usable in, in various circumstances. Um, so the challenge that the Sahara team had prior to Liberty was to create a configuration scheme that was broad enough to allow you to run any of these different types of jobs, which have very different ways that each of them likes to be configured, different ways that information likes to be passed to them, and to do that as simply as possible. And we succeeded, right? There was a solution, as of Kilo, uh, that had three basic categories of configuration parameter that you could shove into a job. Uh, they were configs, which is sort of an engine that's processed by, or, or a dictionary that's processed by the engine. Uh, you know, an example of that might be the number of mappers in a Hadoop job, right? That gets pass processed by the engine itself. Um, there are params, which is another dict that gets processed by the job itself. So these are named arguments that you pass into the job. Uh, that you have written into your job specifically to make it more reusable. And then finally, there are args, um, which are also processed by the job and take the form of a list. So these are only referenced positionally by the job itself. And as you can see, you know, different engine or diff different job types, Java, MapReduce, HiPig, etc., can use different sets of these. Uh, there's also a, a complication with input and output data sources. Some of these specifically take top-level input-output data sources uh, as arguments to the job. Some don't. It, it worked. And this is fundamentally what it looks like as of Kilo when you're trying to run a job. You know, you've got a main class. You know, here, it, this is a Java job type. Um, so these, this stuff up here, the main class, the Java options, these check mark marks, these are fundamentally UI sugar. There's nothing in the API to express these, but we, we built these into our UI because we know that these are things that Java jobs need, and it was nice to have them here. But if you're using the API itself, there really aren't any rails to keep you in place. And what you have uh, is you have these little buttons down here for you know, configuration arguments. So just a pop quiz. You know, if, if you're trying to run Terragen, you know, the basic example of a Hadoop job, uh, who knows what to put into those fields to run Terragen? There are some people in this room who probably know, but they don't count because they work on Sahara. Um, so, you know, this is, this is hard. This takes a fair amount of specialized experience uh, to know what to do. And you can figure it out. It's not the end of the world. You know, you can, you can look at the Sahara documentation for a while, you can look at the job that you're running, and, and you can figure out what to map, but it takes time. Uh, and it you know, can be a little aggravating, even if you already know what's happening. So there are a few assumptions that we made uh, as a team that made this a pretty good solution. And I want to be clear that these are valid assumptions. Right? There's nothing wrong with any of these statements, really, or at least not deeply wrong. 
um, you know, when you're wrapping multiple backends, exposing the deep utility of those backends trumps ease of use. That's true, right? You want to enable your power users to use all the features of your backends. Otherwise, you know, they're going to hit a wall and they're going to go somewhere else. You know, we're writing software for experts, fundamentally on OpenStack. You know, OpenStack operators are professionals. Uh, if, if they hit those walls, they're going to stop. So we have to give the full feature set. Um, and finally, the last assumption, uh, and this is a really basic software assumption that's incredibly important to keep in mind all the time and bit us in this case, is that the simplest thing that can possibly work is usually the best solution. And that's, that's absolutely stunningly true. That'll never stop being true. Um, but we'll, we'll get to a caveat. Um, and this solution was a great start. Because in the end, what we're doing with Sahara and other OSS projects in OpenStack is pretty hard, right? These abstractions that we're creating, Sahara for data processing engines, Trove for databases, block devices in Cinder, there are a lot of implementations of these. Each of them has its own unique features. And creating a proper abstraction that can actually deal with all of these at the same time um, is a legitimately difficult task. Making it easy is even harder. Um, but nonetheless, that is fundamentally our challenge. We are here to unlock the entire market uh, through cloud infrastructure. The upside here is that if we actually do, you know, the world gets better. We, you know, we, we commoditize cloud infrastructure. Many different companies can get in on the game. It's better for the whole market uh, if we can win this fight. And making it easy enough that it's widely adopted is a huge part of how we get there. Um, so, you know, this, this is a real challenge, it's a hard one, but it's unambiguously a, a good one. The bad news is that it's not always really possible, right? In this Sahara case, we could make a, a pretty UI for each engine, and in fact we did, right? We, we put in as much sugar for the Java job type as we could to make that easy to run. But fundamentally, we don't know what your job needs. You haven't written it yet. You, we can't know what parameters you're going to want to pass in. We can't know what arguments you're going to want to pass in. There, there's no way that we can actually create your UI for your job and make it usable. You have to provide those values. We can only build, you know, we can build pipes for you to use. The question that we haven't asked yet, and the critical question for this talk, is who are you? Um, and we're going to be talking about that next. We've been saying you a lot, but who you are actually matters very deeply in this case. So um, we're going to be talking about user stories now. Um, I say congratulations on attending the Least Bleeding Edge Talk at Summit, because fundamentally this concept has been around for a long time. Uh, you know, the, the Agile Manifesto happened a while ago user stories have been around. Um, but they are very seldom actually properly used. You know, there's a place for user stories in our templates, and you know, there's, a, there's actually an OpenStack Summit uh, channel called User Stories, and it's about user experiences with OpenStack. Uh, but I've, I've very seldom seen the, the term user stories within the OpenStack community actually map to what the traditional Agile user story is. Um, so we're going to talk about that now. So, you know, an admission, I, I am impressed that this talk was voted in. It was really interesting to me, and it's incredibly important. Uh, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's not the most exciting hip thing happening right now. Uh, you know, as I say, you, sh you should all be at some presentation about containerizing bare metal. You know, just, just go. Um, but seriously, since you're all still here and nobody's walking out the door yet, this is a user story. Um, sort of the, the Agile classic, it has three parts. Uh, the first is as a, and then you define the role of the user that you're talking about. I want to, the feature, and so that, the value. Uh, so an example of that, you know, as a big data framework user, I want to create a job template 
so that I can launch my job repeatedly with various configurations. Sounds pretty good, right? That's, that's a fundamental user story. No, that was terrible. That was just an awful user story. A big data framework user is not nearly specific enough. We need to get a lot more concrete about that because in the end, there are a few different categories of people who are interested in using these frameworks, right? So you've got someone who actually needs data first off. So someone who's actually going to make decisions based on something that they can't see yet because they have too much data to actually parse through it and make the decision that they need to come to. Um, we have a data scientist who writes algorithms and you know, spends all their days thinking about algorithms, thinking about the best, most efficient way to process the data through. Uh, we have a job developer who takes those algorithms, actually writes code, um, stores those jobs in Sahara, hopefully, because Sahara is just great, um, and a cluster operator who actually then runs those jobs and maintains the clusters on which they run. Any number of these people in any one organization may well be the same person, right? Especially in smaller organizations, you are legitimately going to have job developers who operate their own clusters and data scientists who run, who, who write jobs, um, or, you know, who or just job developers who develop their own algorithms and don't have a data scientist backing them. That's perfectly valid. But any number of these people may be wholly separate. Um, and in the case that they are separate people, you really need to think about who this person is and what they know. Um, so, you know, it's important to rem remember that UX isn't actually one size fits all. You know, the job developer knows how to configure these job types. He knows how to write them, knows how they, they're configured, knows what the jobs themselves want in order to work. And at least at first, before documenting it, that job developer is the only person on Earth who knows how to configure the job that they just wrote. Right? No, no one else knows. Uh, they probably, and uh, I was this person, so I can tell you, you know, I didn't know the paths in the cluster uh, that my jobs were eventually going to run on. That wasn't my domain. Uh, I sort of knew Hadoop administration. I was OK at it, uh, but only sort of came into pinch hit. Um, and usually, as a developer, we think that our code makes sense. We wrote it that way uh, for a reason, hopefully. And we you know, imagine that what we've written is naturally intuitive. We're frequently wrong. Um, as developers, I think you know, the experience of every developer sort of speaks to that, how, how often what we intend is, is misinterpreted. Uh, but we keep going anyway. The cluster administrator, on the other hand, knows cluster administration like the back of their hand. They know how to make the cluster sing. And they're the only person on Earth who knows the minute-to-minute -minute data flow on that cluster. Um, you know, and their relationship with the job developer is probably punctuated by frequent complaints that the jobs aren't documented well enough. Uh, the jobs are probably documented on some wiki somewhere, uh, which is constantly sort of sinking into uh, you know, lack, of, uh, lack of maintenance. And usually, you know, usually the cluster operator is right, and communication with the job developer becomes somewhat of an onerous task. So right here, you know, there's this, there's this role transition, right? The job developer is going to register their binaries, create a job template. The cluster operator is going to be, you know, configuring the cluster, launching it, probably running the job. And right there, there is a change between people, a change between skill sets. And it's easy for us as, you know, it's easier for us as developers of OpenStack who know the whole flow and think about the whole flow to imagine that, okay, everybody has our own knowledge, and everybody's going to be able to map these things through effectively. Um, because of that role transition, that's really not true. And if we wrote two different user stories for those two different people, we'd end up with a very different set of requirements, which would end up with a very different implementation in the end. So that's fundamentally what happened here. So let's, let's recheck our assumptions from earlier. Right? When wrapping multiple backends, exposing those, that deep utility, not letting people hit a wall of expertise, trumps ease of use. That's still true. There's still nothing untrue about that, so that's great. We get to keep that one. Um, we're building infrastructure 
and our users are experts. That's true, but our users have different sets of expertise, right? Which we've just, we've just unveiled. Um, no one's going to be expert in everything. Right, we, we like to imagine sort of the superhuman user who, who knows development and knows cluster operation and, and knows the whole picture and can bear the weight of the word, world on their shoulders, but that person seldom exists uh, in real organizations or in the world itself. Uh, and it's, it's silly to expect that. Fundamentally, the purpose of OpenStack is to make this stuff easier, um, not, to, you know, not to only allow the best of the best to run it. Um, and finally, the simplest thing that can possibly work is usually the best solution. That's true. Uh, but, you know, the question that we're asking now is, who is the solution actually simplest for? You know, is it OpenStack devs? Uh, is it the, the tech underlying this engine? Or is it the end user itself? So what's, what's simplest for them is the real question. Uh, so now we're going to get into sort of what we did to actually address this problem in this use case. So what we created was a, a, an, an interface map or a, a tool that allows you to create a job, a, a method signature effectively um, for your job. So when you register a job template, you can now with that job template register a number of arguments, right? So in this case, this is Terragen, uh, what we took the pop quiz on earlier. Um, yeah, it has an example class, a number of rows of data to create. Uh, Terragen happens to create massive amounts of data for load testing of Hadoop clusters. Usually you run TerraSort on it to benchmark. Uh, and Terragen itself does some nice benchmarking for you too on, on map only stuff. Uh, so rows, uh, output path, it's gonna need somewhere to actually write the data to, and finally a mapper count. You know, we, maybe we want to adjust the number of mappers involved. Uh, we talked earlier about args, configs, and params. You can give them a mapping type. So these three need to be args. They're in that order. Uh, configs, you know, this, the mapper count is a config that gets sh shoved into MapReduce map tasks. They each have a value type. Each can be required or not required. And you can give each one a default value if you like. So this is now, a, you know, we've, we've taken the task of configuring the job away from the cluster operator. Right? The cluster operator doesn't have to care as much about figuring out how the job needs to be configured. We've pushed that back to the job developer because the job developer on average is going to be doing the job template create task. And they're gonna know, they're gonna know exactly what their job needs and they're gonna be able to define a schema. Um, so now when the cluster operator does this, you know, the, the job launch config, all they have to do is this. They, you know, job ID, et cetera. And then they pass in an interface. You can have you know, rows, mapper count, output path. Because the example class had a default value, they don't have to provide it. Um, and it's, you know, it provides a nice semantic view. Uh, and the, in the UI, it gets even more semantic, as we'll see in a few minutes. Um, so you know, this is fundamentally what you do uh, to create an interface. Uh, this is Horizon. So, you select a value type for each argument. You can name them, you can give them a description uh, so that the cluster operator has a good idea of what actually goes there. It can be as verbose as you like. Being verbose is friendly. <laughs> that way you don't have to maintain that wiki, which always falls over. Give them a mapping type, give them a, give them a location, value type, tell us whether it's required, and provide a default value if you care to. And that's fundamentally the feature. Um, so we are, in fact, putting a schema in our schema so that you can define a job interface while you define an interface. And that's, that's fundamentally what this is, right? All we're doing is building a DDL. We're building a data definition language. It's not exciting tech-wise, but it's fantastically powerful and useful at those, uh, you know, at, at those transitions between roles there didn't actually have to be any change to the engine here. And that's, that's what I like about this, this solution, is that fundamentally, because we had already created a solution that allowed you know, any use case to be filled, allowed the args and configs and params to pass all the way through to the job, 
in any case, all we had to do was sort of bolt on a translation layer on top. You know, an, an additional pipe by which the job developer could provide information and the job operator could take it, uh, use it, and have you know a much more uh, simple and a, m a much simpler interface and an interface which spoke much better to their knowledge of both the jobs that are running specifically and the engines that are powering them. You know, the, the, it's really the job developer's job to know what pig wants, what hive wants, what Java wants. The cluster operator shouldn't care about that. They should care about HDFS. They should care about keeping the cluster running. Um, so, you know, it, it does require dev, dev effort, of course, but it also fills doc requirements. So there's good reason for the job developer to want this too. You know, maintaining that wiki is annoying. They, they, need, to, they need to do a lot of onerous communication and it can get problematic. Uh, creating this allows them to define that schema once, have it be machine validated as well, so that, you know, easy errors in job configuration can be catched early by Sahara and we can stop them before they hit the cluster and take up time, which is expensive. So, you know, the, the takeaway here is that we, we were right earlier. We can't know the jobs config schema. You haven't written it yet, but we can give you tools to describe it. We can give you tools to communicate. Uh, and that's fundamentally where the empathy piece comes in here. You know, by thinking about what the job developer needs, by thinking about what the cluster, cluster operator needs, we've actually, you know, found a way to put ourselves in both of their shoes, fundamentally by allowing them to put it th themselves in each other's, right? We have empathy all around. There's just a big triangle of empathy between the OpenStack dev and these two people. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, humans here win. So we did a pop quiz earlier um, about this job, you know, asked, asked whether we could run it. Uh, not many people said yes. How do we feel about this job? You know, there's an example class. It default, has a default value that's pre-populated with Terragen. Data rows to generate says, you know, if you mouse over the little question mark, this number of 100 byte rows will be generated. Gives you an output path which defaults to an HDF path and has a number of mappers field. Could, could people run this? Matt, Matt can't, but Matt's a manager now. So, you know, that happens. All right. Um, <laughs> so I, I did see some heads, heads sh uh, shake yes, though, so that's good. So the, the sort of the summary and takeaway here uh, is know your users' roles. Look for those inter-role transitions in your flow. Uh, and this is hard, right? You, you have to either have real-world experience with organizations running your tech um, if, if you don't, you really have to go and actively pull them uh, and, and ask for that feedback and, and really act on it and internalize it. Um, and then ask, you know, okay, within the flow that I'm imagining we're going to create, does each user actually have enough information um, and have enough knowledge and expertise to do what they need to do? If you can, you give it directly to them. But in this case, we couldn't. But we could still, you know, and the the simplest thing to do uh, can be to leave that dynamic, but you know, sometimes building tools to help them communicate is, is really the right answer. And pure dynamism like we had before with you know, args and configs and params, it was good. It did what we needed, but that's a last resort. Um, generally, you really want to, um, to build more communication tools than that. So, all right, good, we're doing well for time. Uh, a few closing thoughts before we open for questions. Uh, you know, there's this fallacy that we've already talked about of the, the power user and sort of the super user who knows everything. Um, and, you know, as developers, we, we sometimes get sucked into this idea, okay, I'm really smart, right? Um, great minds think alike. Other people who are pretty smart must, must think like me, must understand my code and, and what I'm imagining things are going to do here. Um, and therefore, whatever I write, because I'm pretty smart, Anybody who's sufficiently bright should be able to understand. Uh, and this is not great. I don't think it's actually what happened with the original Sahara team. Um, you know, things, there were time pressures as well. Um, but there's a little bit of, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, well, this is good enough, and people who are smart enough will be able to figure it out. Uh, that's a frequent part of any development process I've ever been involved with. 
Um, and, you know, it, it is a little bit distressingly common in OSS sometimes. There's a little bit of a, of a almost macho culture uh, in OSS that would really be better to, uh, better to resolve. You know, I've talked about the word empathy a fair amount, and I, I actually really like that word. I think it's important. Uh, you know, we talk a lot in software about user focus and about customer focus, and I, I don't think that they're adequate. Uh, you know, both sort of imagine the user itself as business resources, uh, as, as, you know, cogs in some machine. They're not. They're, they're people. Um, and speaking and creating flows that allow them to do their job well, you know, it doesn't matter just technically. It matters morally. Um, you know, fundamentally, these, these virtues, you know, making complexity accessible, enabling structured, clear communication, empowering everybody who use our products, you know, those are the some of the fundamental virtues of the software engineering craft. And, you know, anybody in this room who is a software engineer, you know, I, I hope takes those very seriously and, and thinks daily about, you know, how to do these well. You know, fundamentally, engineering, you know, we, we think of as this sort of heavily corporatized thing sometimes, but it's a mission as well. We, we, we do good work. We do good things. We make things possible that weren't before. Um, and that virtue of empathy uh, is, is fundamental in what we do. Because, you know, especially in OpenStack, you know, we, we do need to win. Uh, this infrastructure does need to be democratized. It's, it's not okay to allow you know, to, to allow there to be, you know, a, a handful of technologies owned by a handful of people and not allow the infrastructure of the world to be anything more than that. Um, and to commoditize cloud, we really do need solid UX. You know, that's, that's the way we're going to attract users and what we're doing is, is fundamentally important. So, you know, if you're a developer in this room, this is, this is a how to contribute talk. I, I know some people are here because they're interested in Sahara as well. Uh, but fundamentally, you know, I, I wish to exhort you. Um, so, I, you know, as a closing, I've, I have made a lot of fun of this presentation in terms of, you know, oh, it's, it's not the newest thing in the whole world. Uh, at the same time, I, I am really heartened that it was selected. I'm, I'm heartened that, you know, for, for a how to contribute presentation, we're doing pretty well for audience. Uh, you know, the stuff that we're talking about in terms of user stories, role awareness, human empathy, this is really important for us to succeed. Uh, as, as OpenStack, and I'm very glad that we actually talked about it here. Uh, so thank you uh, if you voted for this, and thank you for coming if you didn't, and just thanks. Um, so one very last note before I close for questions. Um, you know, this is a how to contribute talk. It really didn't fit, and in fact, there wasn't really a tr track that fit at all. Uh, when I was looking at, at the various tracks in, in OpenStack Summit, you know, there, there really isn't a category for developers talking with each other about lessons learned, about best practices. Uh, and that's understandable. You know, OpenStack Summit is fundamentally a marketing exercise as well, and there's nothing wrong with that. That needs to happen, too, to get people excited in our product because we need to win. Um, at the same time, you know, this is, you know, I've been running around Japan for like a week and a half before now, um, and especially coming from the U.S., you know, Japan is sort of an exercise in sacred geography um, and sacred ground. Uh, and this is our sacred ground as developers. This is where we come together and collaborate and talk about how we're going to make more things possible in the future. Uh, so, you know, it might be cool to actually have a track for this kind of thing to happen uh, from here on out. So, um, all right. So, any, any questions? Before we before we close, oh, um, being being new to Tokyo. Oh, I see. Um, sure, <laughs> you know, uh, Tokyo and J Japan in general. Um, you know, in, in the United States, everything is is. You know, we, we, we destroyed a fair amount of our history. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, things, things are pretty new. Um, there, there are a few places that we consider important to ourselves as a people. Um, but walking around the city of Tokyo and walking around Japan in general, you, you get a very deep sense um, of how deeply the history and, and traditions of the Japanese people map to specific places um, in, in, in the world around them. 
and in a way that's uh, that's that's wonderful and and fascinating and and different. Um, Um, sure, we're getting a little philosophical here, but okay, we got a little philosophical, so that's fair. It's turnabout is fair play, right? No, that's that's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know when when I say that summit is is sacred ground, yes, I suppose that you know it's it's both geography and time, but this is you know this is this is a place that is uh, that's important to our people uh, as open stack developers, probably as important as they get. Um, and you know, next time sacred ground will be in Austin and then Bar Barcelona. But you know, we take it with us where we go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, Sahara's UI is in contrib. In Horizon, right? So it's it's not in sort of the core panels. It's it's in the contrib path. Um, it may move into its own repository in the near future. It was in its own repository in the past. It it may be there again. Uh, but but for right now, it's it's in contrib, and and those panels are uh, all under the the jobs. Uh, every everything we talked about was under the the jobs panel. Yep. Please. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, that that can be a problem. Is is documenting the documentation feature that yeah that, that's. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I, I have some documentation patches in uh, the Sahara EDP guide. Um, if you take a look at them, I'd be perfectly happy to receive feedback. They're pretty explicit, I think. Um, but, th yeah, they're, they're there. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of this presentation comes down to the idea that documentation is really important, um, which is, we say it all the time, and nobody likes to do it, and uh, it, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like writing documentation. It's very peaceful. <laughs> you know, um, not, not all the brain has to go into it at the same time, but uh, any other questions? Uh, I don't know yet. Right. Uh, so one one of the big things that I want to tackle next cycle personally is our uh, our image generation process, uh, which currently is difficult. Uh, it, it takes it takes a bit of a super user uh, to to do it well uh, or at all sometimes. Uh, and you know, admittedly, it's it's a process which often you're going to do once, and then you're going to be able to use Sahara for a very long period of time, and it's a you know, and it's something that's put on the administrator uh, of OpenStack fundamentally, rather than on the end user in a public cloud. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been deemed good enough, especially because the Sahara community itself can frequently, you know, generate images, publish them, allow them to be used, and offload that from the end user. But especially as you know, we have more and more configuration options. We're going to need to pack allow users to create their own images. Uh, the, the matrix is just going to swell to a point at which we can't possibly support everything anybody could want. Uh, so that, that needs to be cleaned up. Yes. Right. You know, to, to get things running quickly. And people will default to that when it's easy, right? Yes. So I guess, I guess the, the view about it, you're, you're saying there's two parts. There's part of it's the administrator side and part of it's sort of the job creator. Mm -hmm. I just want to get your, your take on that and also, like, how much did OpenStack take on making things easy for administrators? You know, you know, or is it 
Sure. Well, I mean, you know, so I, I've actually talked with some of the places I worked at, you know, before Red Hat, before OpenStack, uh, about about you know, hey. You want to hear the good news about OpenStack, uh, and you know a lot of them are adopting cloud. Uh, at the same time, they they don't have the resources to take on their own cloud administration right now. The more we can reduce that bar, right, and allow people to start to start running their own clouds, um, or at least to create you know enough public clouds that there's there's better competition, there's a better market, uh, the the better things get, and that absolutely will depend on. OpenStack operator UX, right? The more the more we can push that bar down, the better we do. Uh, period. You know, it's just. I mean, absolutely, yes. Uh, and that's that that's that's the beautiful thing about what happened with this specific feature is we had already created the really dynamic thing that let you do anything you wanted to. And we built on this nice translation layer on top of it. That previous layer all still exists, and you can still use it. Um, so, so we kind of get the best of both worlds, right? We get the deep config, we get the user experience with the nice, pretty UI for the operator, um, and you know, and all's well. So, uh, yeah, I think you know both both concerns are are valid. You, know, you still have to allow the full feature set to stand. Are we out of time? I think we are. Um, so, all right. Uh, thank you all uh, for coming. I've enjoyed talking. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the presentation. So, thank you.